Great. Thank you, Chrissy. Good afternoon, everybody. We appreciate your taking some time with us today. We have one change in the program to announce Kathy Stanton, who is our uh, leader of our state and local tax practice. She woke up under the weather today and is not able to join us, uh, but that's all right. We've still got some excellent presenters, and I will fill in for the portion that Kathy was had planned to uh, talk to with you about. So today we've got Lauren Stinson, who is our partner and a national leader for our sales and use tax uh, uh, services, and Jarrett Moore, who is a senior and in, uh, works very closely with a lot of our state income tax issues. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the agenda for today, the topics we're going to cover. First, Lauren is going to talk about sales and use tax issues and really what's been going on since the Wayfair decision. Uh, Jarrett will talk about the other big issue that's happened over this last year and is still rolling into 2019, and that is how are the states responding to federal tax reform. And then uh, I will talk to you a bit at the end about how this outlook, how what this, the, the SALT issues look like going beyond this year into 2020 and, and later, what are sort of the trends that we're seeing and expect to be taking place. And along the way, we will talk to you about some things that we know that are particular to our southeastern states. That's the footprint for our practice, even though we serve clients throughout the the uh, uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. So we'll be talking about important states and uh, particularly when things come up in our footprint states here in the Southeast. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started and uh, move on to our first topic, which is sales and use and what the issues are for 2019. So Lauren, help us out here. All right, thanks, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, I'm going to be kicking off the webinar today talking about sales tax and really what's all been happening um, in the world of sales tax. So to kick us, kick us off, um, let's talk about Nexus. And really, the changes in sales tax, I've been working in the sales tax industry for 25 years, and this is really the biggest change that we've had um, in the world of sales tax in my whole career of 25 years. So the world of sales tax has turned upside down um, as a result of the Supreme Court ruling last year in South Dakota versus Wayfair. So previously, the, the old standard of a, um, a company had, it, um, had to have a physical presence in a state before the state could impose sales tax obligations, that, that standard was put aside. It's still in effect, but it was added to by the concept of economic nexus. And the Wayfair decision upheld a ruling that a state could impose a sales tax obligation, meaning a company needed to collect and remit tax if they had an economic presence in the state. And this you know, ended a decade old battle between businesses and states where businesses didn't want to have to collect sales tax. States of course wanted them to collect tax on their behalf and really put together, put, put an end to a 25 year old battle. Um, states won, economic nexus standards um, were imposed. The decision happened in June, and the the state's responses have have been very very rapid. Um, so far, there's been 36 states that have imposed economic laws, and we're starting we're we're seeing it move very very quickly. So, what is economic nexus? So, economic nexus is driven by a customer base, and most states, they're, they're taking the approach that if you sell a certain amount into a state or a number of transactions into a state, you have economic nexus. So most states are taking the, the standard of $100,000 of sales into that state or 200 transactions. And you know, $100,000 is it's a fair amount. But what's really killing a lot of sellers is that 200 transactions. That is 200 sales into, into a state. And that will kick 
tick off your economic nexus, meaning that you have to register and start collecting and remitting sales tax. Um, you know, so one of the things that, that's important to know is that you know, every state, there's 36 states that are imposing economic nexus. And most states, if they don't already have economic nexus um, on their books, and um, they do have pending legislation. So I think it's going to be very likely by the end of the year, we will see uh, every state that imposes a sales tax have an economic nexus requirement. Um, you know, some things that to be mindful of is that every state can set the standard a little bit differently. So most states, like I said, are at $100,000 or 200 transactions. There's a few states where it's a dollar threshold and a number of transactions, or it's just a dollar amount. So it's very, you know, it's very mindful that what creates nexus or economic nexus in one state won't be across the board. Um, you know, and, and even though these states are quickly adapting this economic nexus, it's, it's still moving forward because there are states that are, have already adopted economic nexus that they're still fine tuning. For example, California, and pay attention, California is you know, obviously the biggest state and their economic nexus goes into effect on uh, April 1st, so in just about a week. They have $100,000 and 200 transactions. There is pending legislation to raise that to 500,000 and no number of transactions, but for the moment, when it kicks in, it's at 100,000 and 200 transactions. So they're actually kind of raising the bar a little bit. On the other hand, Georgia, they have pending legislation to lower it from 250 transactions, or I'm sorry, $250,000 to 100,000 transactions, $100,000. So you can see that as, you know, as the start, states start settling into this, they are adjusting what they consider to be economic nexus. So moving on to some frequently asked questions you know, regarding economic nexus. One of the first questions that we always get is, you know, what, what happens to physical nexus? So physical nexus versus economic nexus. And first of all, physical nexus will always trump economic nexus. So Wayfair did not um, eliminate physical nexus. So if you have a physical presence, meaning you have offices, employees, sales reps traveling into a state, independent companies working on your behalf, you still have physical nexus. Even if you don't meet the economic nexus thresholds, you still have nexus. The next question is what is the time period for these thresholds? So you know, when what time do you have to meet these sales thresholds or transaction thresholds? And that's gonna depend on the state. Some states are using a calendar year some states are using a rolling four quarter period and some states are using a fiscal year. So again, you really have to get into the details of every state because it, it will vary on a state by state basis. Same thing with the um, you know, exempt sales. So you know, very, it varies from state to state where some states will include exempt sales into that sales thresholds some states will not. So you, you have to be mindful of you know, what, what's the base on which you are you know, starting to count, count to those uh, transactions. Another frequently asked question is, do I owe back taxes on economic nexus? So economic nexus only kicks in at the time period that you meet these standards. So until you meet these standards, if you, if you haven't had physical presence, then economic nexus has not kicked in. So in most states, it is effective immediately after you reach these, um, these thresholds. But in some, some states, we'll give you a little bit of grace period to you know, get yourself organized and registered. Uh, will, will Congress do anything? So this is where we, we wish we had a crystal ball. Um, there is, you know, there, there always has been, you know, for the last many, you know, 25 years, 
and there probably will continue to be legislation in this area to see if Congress will do something. They historically have not, you know, not done anything. Um, and you know, economic nexus is a good way for the states to collect revenue that they otherwise were not getting. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it is unlikely that there's going to be broad sweeping um, elimination of the economic nexus, but there may be a little bit more consistency among the states. Do international sellers need to com to comply? And the answer is yes. So even though uh, a foreign um, a company in a foreign uh, location may have a treaty for federal tax that does not apply to sales tax. So that that's kind of the big trends on economic nexus. You know, that is continuing to evolve and something that every company that's selling in multi-states should be keeping their eye on. The next um, big area also that's come about in the last year is the growing um, adoption of marketplace facilitator legislation. So this is where the states impose collection responsibilities on a marketplace on behalf of third-party sellers. So the, a good example of this is Amazon. So nine states have already adopted legislation. 22 states have pending legislation where, where the marketplace will be collecting tax on behalf of the, on behalf of the um, third party seller. So I expect that nearly all the states will adopt this. Um, it does give some relief to sellers who only sell on a marketplace, but you need to be warned of companies that operate on multi-channel. So they're selling on a, on a marketplace in addition to having their own website or a different form of um, platform. So as we start getting into you know, the, the impact of Wayfair, we need to start looking at taxability. And you know, some of the complicated factors for sales tax really focus on the changing landscape of our business. And one of the biggest challenges is really defining your product or defining the product or service that you're performing in regards to how it fits into the tax code. And you know, as technology changes, it gets harder and harder to you know, make that distinction because tax law does not keep up nearly at the pace that technology does. And some uh, difficult things really focus on technology. Um, digital goods, software as a service, electronically downloaded, software, data processing, all those are very difficult to define, um, you know, as far as the tax code, and taxability varies from state to state. So that's another complicating factor. In addition, sourcing really becomes complicated because, you know, sometimes you, it's hard to really define where, where you're making that sale where the users are or where the benefit of that, that sale or service is. So again, it, the, the complexity around sales tax continues to grow. Some other trends that we're seeing are states are expanding their tax base. So you know, as, as technology changes and landscape changes, digital goods and streaming services are starting to be taxed more by more and more states, as well as more and more states are broadening that tax base by imposing taxes on more and more services. So the you know the the, the tax code is trying to keep pace with the changing landscape of our world. There's also more and more taxes um, on what we call sin goods, so things like vaping products or soda. And these can be sales tax and excise taxes. That's another way for the tax base to expand. And then tax rate changes. So, you know, states occasionally will change their tax rates, but local, local jurisdictions change them quite frequently. So again, expect to see more and more tax rate changes. 
So the next area to, that I want to focus on is enforcement. So with everything going on, how do states track down remote sellers? And they do that really in a, a variety of different ways. First, they can send out Nexus questionnaires. So if they suspect that your company has Nexus in a particular state, they'll send a letter and expect you to respond. And that's a good way for them to bring in new taxpayers. They also do data analytics from other tax types. For example, if you're filing income tax or payroll tax in the state, it doesn't take a whole lot to figure out why are you not filing sales tax. They also look at audits of um, like your customers. They also have uh, aud other, um, audits from other states of so their questionnaires, subpoenas. Um, that's a, 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 a growing way. For example, Amazon subpoenaed California and got the seller list. And, and as a result, California sent out over 20,000 notices to Amazon third-party sellers. They also can stop trucks at the borders. There's rewards for information and you know, competitors send in leads all the time. So the states are taking a very aggressive approach. There's many different ways they can find uncompliant taxpayers. So it's getting increasingly hard to fly under the radar. So that being said, how far back can a state go to assert the nexus? Um, if you have physical presence, the state, if, if they find you, they can go all the way back to the point where you first had Nexus and assess the tax that you did not collect. You go all the way back to the beginning of time when you first had physical presence. Whereas economic, ne economic presence and economic Nexus, they can go all the way back to the point where you cross that threshold. So it's very important that you're very mindful of when you, when you create a nexus, if you create a nexus, and when you create a nexus, and make sure that you are you're getting compliant because, again, it's, it's hard to fly under the radar. Now, if you, you know, as you're looking at this, if you've determined that you have had nexus for a period of time and you have liabilities for sales tax that you did not collect, there are programs such as a voluntary disclosure agreement where you can go to the state, you can voluntarily come forward, and usually the look back period is shortened to three or four years, um, generally a statute of limitations, and penalty is waived. So they don't, the states won't have that, that extended look back period. So if you know that you are not compliant, that could be a very good way to uh, have some remediation. I think we have a polling question now. Have you or your business implemented changes in sales tax reporting due to Wayfair? Yes, uh, no, it's not really applicable or I'm not sure yet. Uh, so let's leave that poll up. And while we have that up, um, Lauren, we had a question that came in about what constitutes a transaction for that hundred count threshold. Is it is it one invoice for a customer, or is it uh, uh, each individual item? If there might be three or four items on an invoice, tell us how the they're thinking, or some of the states may be thinking about that that count. That's a great question. Um, we're seeing most of the states respond that they're considering it to be at an invoice level. All right. Not not a line line by line order, just one invoice. Right. And uh, what about the? Are, are we beyond looking at just the terms of the transaction? Who takes ownership at which location? Uh, is it is it at the shipping point when the customer takes, or when it arrives at the customer's dock? Does that still control, in large part, um, for tangible goods where that transaction takes place, or are there other other issues that we have to consider? Um, you know, and that's a great question. And again, it, it can vary from state to state, but most states, if the goods are shipped in interstate commerce, the taxability and the tax jurisdiction rests where uh, the the buyer is located, so where the goods are delivered. All right, great. 
Okay, well, hope everybody has had a chance to look at poll number one. Uh, let's, Chrissy, let's go ahead and close that poll and uh, let's move on to the next discussion. Okay, we got to, uh, we see that, yeah, a good number of people are actually um, participating and looking at changes that are Im impacted by Wayfair. All right, okay. Lauren, talk to us some more about uh, how sales tax is actually collected. Sure. So, you know, for a lot of companies, you know, they may, um, that may have only had sales tax obligations or one or two states, they could do it manually. But now as the, the burden has you know, ex exploded and there may be more and more you know, states that they have to collect tax for, more and more rates that they need to get, it may be time to look at tax automation where there's software that automatically it reaches up into the cloud and pulls down a real-time tax rate. Now there's you know, a lot of software out there, um, Avalara, Vertex, TaxJar, Taxify. And we work with a number of different number of different um, tax automation softwares. You know, it can be hard and expensive to implement, and it does take some time to ensure correct mapping, but it can work really well. And as you know, as um, economic nexus grows and the sales tax burden becomes more and more complex. There are a lot of companies that really should start looking at using some sort of tax automation. Uh, another very important aspect as kind of the fallout to Wayfair is looking at exemption certificate issues. Um, you know, if you, if you have the responsibility to collect tax in the state, you either need to be collecting the tax or collecting an exemption certificate from a customer. And often the lack of certificates are often the largest um, area of assessment under an audit. So, you know, you want to make sure that you've got a good system in place for who's collecting the tax, who's going to validate them, um, who's going to manage the renewal process, you know, everything that you, you know, everything that you need to manage that process because lack of exemption certificates can really um, have a large financial impact on a company under an audit. And then wrapping, wrapping it up, we just move to compliance. So, you know, once you have understand you know, where you need to be registered and you've got systems in place to uh, be collecting the tax, you still have to file some you still have to file tax returns. And again, collecting in more and more states equals more and more tax returns to be filed, which is going to require more and more resources. There's more and more errors. Um, there's going to be an increased number of audits. And audits are very time consuming for a, um, for a company and the staff. So basically, it is a, you know, this the fallout of Wayfair is a huge impact that it's, you know, at some point it's worth the consideration of, is it, you know, is it still a reliable um, solution to do compliance in-house or is it more cost effective to outsource it? And then just wrapping up, you know, what should I do now? You know, just a few words of wisdom, you know, review your Nexus obligations and review state law. It's, it's quickly changing and not every state is the same. Review the taxability of your products, especially if you're in a technology industry. Make sure you've got a streamlined sales tax collection and compliance function within your company. Um, keep your eye on sales tax. You know, this is, again, ra rapidly changing and um, again, more changes than I've seen in my whole career just in the last nine months. And then finally, ask for help. And that's why we are here. All right. I think we're up to our second polling question. So, Chrissy, if you'll go ahead and, and put our second polling question up. So, do you expect a rise in costs of compliance for your sales and use tax reporting? Do you think this is uh, – do you see that um, – Maybe you've already seen some costs rise uh, that are that are out there. Um, some of you have, have asked for some resources about some of the numbers of states that were mentioned, and uh, we will have access and, and point you to, 
to that resource at the end of the program where you can go to find out more information that we keep up to date uh, about states and, and what's been happening. So uh, last, last call on our polling question number two, do you expect a rise in costs of compliance? Yes, no, not applicable. Um, Chrissy, let's go ahead and publish those results and we'll close the poll. All right, looks like, yes, most of you are expecting uh, an, an increase in costs relative to these new um, new compliance rules that are rolling out across the country. All right, let's change gears a little bit here and talk about another issue. And Jarrett, talk to us about what is happening when at the states and how they're responding to uh, all the changes brought to us by federal tax reform. Yeah, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, Lauren just gave us a great overview of kind of the, the sales, sales and use tax picture coming into 2019. We're going to take a few minutes to, to look at income franchise tax, specifically, again, how, they, how we mentioned how the states have directly responded to federal tax reform. Now, before we can look at any specific provisions of the federal tax reform, um, many of these fell under the Tax Cuts and Job Act. We really have to identify how the states conform to the Federal Internal Revenue Code as the creation of, of their base income tax calculation. Now, most states that do impose one of these taxes do conform to it at some specific date um, using one of three methods. Um, those methods may be on a rolling conformity basis, essentially staying always in conformance with the current version of the Internal Revenue Code, whatever may have been passed at the time at the federal level or a static conformity, so conforming to a specific to that, a specific version of that internal revenue code as of a specific date, or maybe some form of selective conformity, even conforming to specific provisions of the internal revenue code, and those provisions may be conformed to at either a rolling basis, so continually, or at a static date of their own. Um, the selective conformity can create a lot of confusion. Now, for instance, if a state only conforms to the Internal Revenue Code as of t December 31st, 2015. Any changes made in the current year, such or in the pa or in the past couple years, such as tax reform, will not be included in their general code conformity. Looking briefly at this map, you can see that most states do conform on a rolling basis, with the remainder being broken up between some version of selective or static conformity. Of note, many of the states in the southeast, especially our footprint, footprint states, such as Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina, are all on a static conformity. But of note, also the states of Tennessee and Alabama are in rolling conformity. In addition to conforming as of the code at a specific date, many states are also passing state-specific modifications to specific internal revenue codes sections. These departures are typically enacted because federal priorities for taxation may not align exactly with each state's individual priorities under their individual state tax codes. A few of these common departures are the deductions for state and local income tax, deductions for federal bonus depreciation, immediate access asset expensing, the former domestic productions activities deduction, or the method of calculation calculating state net operating losses, or whether or not they conform to the federal net operating loss or the method of calculating dividends received deductions if that deduction is allowed at all. This, as of the date of compliance, is an additional method states can use to either conform or not conform to federal tax changes. These two methods will generally drive whether or not a state will conform or require specific modifications to changes such as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or other elements of federal tax reform. Now, we do want to look at a few specific provisions of the Tax Cuts and Job Act. The, the Tax Cuts and Job Act did provide extensive changes to the federal tax code, and we don't have time to look at all of them. But we have identified a few that we, will believe, that we believe will be most important to taxpayers in the 2019 tax year and within completing their 2018 tax returns that most businesses are still currently working on. The first provision we want to look at is the new business interest deduction limit. Under pre-tax reform law, businesses were generally allowed to deduct all interest paid or accrued with just a few specific limitations. But under the new federal tax reform law, the business interest deductions are generally limited to the sum of 30% of a business's adjusted taxable income 
the business's total interest income received by the business from customers or the to and the inclusion of any interest expense from forward plan financing. This is generally something applicable to auto dealers. Now this adjustable taxable income is something important to consider because this is a separate complex calculation of income that disallows amortization, depreciation, and depletion expenses primarily for the tax years 2018 to 2021. These expenses can be very important to, to businesses that are heavily leveraged or dependent on assets and can greatly reduce the amount of interest they may be able to deduct at a federal or if complying state level for these entities. Now, some exemptions from this are provided, including a specific business business exemption for those with less than $25 million in average gross annual receipts, typically calculated over a three-year basis. So this deduction is going to be a little bit more important for our larger taxpayers. States have had a mixed response to conformity with this provision, but most have conformed to the revised statute. While a lack of conformity may have immediate tax benefits in being able to deduct more interest on the state side than would be immediately allowable on the federal side, these separate calculations of allowable deduction can create extensive state compliance burdens. What also must be considered as is the disallowed interest can be carried forward on an indefinite basis into the future. So this may create extensive state to federal taxable income changes far into the future. Of additional note, the IRS has recently released consolidated filing regulations for large corporate consolidators on how they will calculate this business interest deduction limit, either at a consolidated entity basis or at a separate state basis. <clears throat> for those entities that this is a big concern, this may mean that for, for the states that do not follow the consolidated <clears throat> regulations, as many do not, they may have to calculate this on a separate entity basis and if you have a lot of subsidiaries, this may create an extensive headache. We provided another map showing the general conformity to this provision on a state-by-state -state basis. As you'll see, the vast majority have conformed to the changes under the deduction limit. Though of note, several states in the Southeast have decoupled from this position, specifically Georgia and South Carolina. Like the business interest limit deduction, the qualified business income deduction is going to be another headache or asset for businesses depending on your formation and what states you may operate in. The qualified business income deduction provides an additional deduction for certain domestic businesses taxed as partnerships, as corporations, or sole proprietorships. This deduction provides an additional deduction for 20% of the qualified business income of these entities. Of note, this is another complex, separate calculation that may need to be done on a state-by-state -state basis, depending on their conformity, <clears throat> conformity to the new revised provision. The object of this deduction was to create, was to reduce the disparity between corporate tax rates and individual tax rates that, may not, that were not reduced at the same rate under the federal tax reform. This deduction can generally only be claimed by individuals, trusts, and estates typically the shareholders and the entities mentioned above. Like with the business interest limit deduction, the IRS has released new regulations guiding the calculation of this income, the qualified business income, and how it will apply on individual returns. Now, once again, states may or may not choose to comply to these regulations, and if so, it can mean that this is calculated in a separate method than would be for the federal basis, again, creating extensive federal to state tax differences. For individual taxpayers, most states start their federal ta their state tax income calculation with the federal adjusted gross income as determined on the federal tax reform. Because the QBI deduction for federal purposes is applied after the AGI, most states will mechanically de de depart from the allowance of the QBI for state tax purposes. Some states previously tied their federal compliance <clears throat> to the federal tax or income but the states of Vermont, Oregon, and South Carolina have taken specific action to remedy their, their compliance to this deduction, as we expect many will. At this time, though, the states of Colorado, Idaho, North Dakota are all enrolling conformity with the federal tax income calculation and have not specifically decoupled from the QBI deduction. Therefore, unless they issue further guidance, um, at this time, they will be complying to this additional deduction. 
The next area we want to look at is international taxation. Now you may ask, what does federal taxation of international income have to do with state taxation? Many states, through again their conformity either to the IRC of a as of a specific date or through a state-specific modification, may include all or some portion of the federal taxable income derived from international taxation and the starting point of their state taxable income calculations. This once again flows either from their starting point or specific additions or subtractions created at the individual state level. Now many, but not all, of these states may provide a specific state modification after the inclusion to eliminate some or all of international activity in their state income tax calculation. Now this can create, if this deduction is not provided, this can create issues under the Constitution specifically related to the state, to the the Supreme Court case of Kraft versus the Iowa Department of Revenue that has created some constitutional limits on the state taxation of international income. In shifting to the, the international tax provisions, the federal tax reform attempted to shift the U.S. from a global income taxation base to a territorial taxation base of income. To to facilitate this transition, for tax year 2017, a transaction tax was created under the Internal Revenue Code Section 965 to tax the currently undistributed foreign earnings of, of international corporations with subsidiaries outside the U.S. Now, the inclusion of this in federal income was handled in various ways by the states, and some are still issuing guidance on the proper treatment of this event. <laughs> While this is an ongoing issue for many taxpayers who may be looking to amend or still file their 2017 tax returns, we are going to focus on the current issues as of 2018 and 2019 for the purposes of this presentation. Post this transaction tax, the U.S. has now been led to an international tax system primarily focused on guilty and fitting. Guilty, or globally intangible low tax income, is a complex calculation of foreign income designed to prevent entities from placing intangible assets, such as patents and other intangible, in low tax foreign jurisdictions in order to avoid U.S. taxation. Also provided with guilty is an offsetting deduction that may reduce the rate of tax on this global income that is now being included under federal income. Also aligning with guilty is the new inclusion of federal derived intangible income, or FIDI, is a complex calculation of income derived from foreign sources, this primarily looking at sales of services or tangible and tangible property in foreign jurisdictions. This federal deduction provides a rate reduction for this income that will be taxed in the U.S., but at a lower rate than general domestic earned income. Now this the state tax of guilty and fitty is an ongoing issue for most state, state, state legislatures and departments of revenue, and they're still attempting to figure out how they're going to address this. Under their current conformity provisions, many states may include the income derived from guilty in their state tax base or their state calculation starting points due to specific lines of inclusion on federal forms, but many also do not provide the offsetting guilty and fitty deductions for credits um, or for credits for foreign taxes paid due, the mechanic, due to the state mechanics of this reporting. I'm going to provide a quick overview of a chart provided by this, the Tax Foundation of the states that are conforming or taxing to some extent this guilty income. Now, when states do not provide the, the offsetting guilty deduction or the offsetting fitty deduction, they run the risk of, of violating the, the constitutional limits on state taxation, again provided under the Kraft General Foods versus Iowa Department of Revenue Supreme Court case and the, and the constitutional. Um, most states are taxing it to some extent right now, but of note, the states in the South, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina have decoupled from the provisions. <clears throat> Florida, Alabama, and Tennessee and Virginia are all taxing this income to some extent. When considering these income tax pr provisions, the key takeaway to remember is that each of these may create additional headaches for your state compliance going forward, and most states are still working out how to handle these provisions on their individual returns. This is something to keep in mind as you're getting ready for, to complete the 2018 filing season and stepping into the 2019.
Great, Jared, thank you. Uh, so the, the real message, let's pull, go ahead and pull up polling question number three and give people a chance to look at that. And the question is, will state laws adopting or modifying the tax cuts and jobs at provisions have an impact on your state income tax liability? Uh, we mentioned, uh, Jared mentioned three of the biggest, uh, the 199A qualified business income deduction, the 163J interest expense limitation, and then the last being our new international taxation uh, regime. So will these will state laws that you're in the states you deal with, uh, if they're adopting or modifying these provisions, have an impact, do you think, on your state income tax liability? So Jared, I'm sure you get a lot of questions uh, coming through from uh, our offices and our clients about these areas. And uh, I think uh, frequently you've given me the answer, well, it depends. Uh, and and even many of the states today are still in flux and still having a moving target on whether they adopt or don't adopt some of these provisions. Yeah, that's certainly correct. This, this is one of those things that the states are doing their best to attempt to kind of catch up with the federal, but when you have to consider that there's 50 separate state legislatures, 50 state, separate state departments of revenue, and these guys were not necessarily included in these changes when they were first made, so they're just kind of attempting to catch up and figure out how this is going to be treated, either understanding law or, in the case of many legislatures, passing new legislation to, to kind of handle it either in current and, in some cases, past tax years. Yeah, and if they leave some of it alone and don't make changes, then, then it could be a boon to the state with a rise in income. Uh, and if they, they did not lower their their the state tax rates the way the federal lowered the corporate rate so it could be a boon to the states and some additional revenue if they just uh if they don't make any adjustment yeah this is correct uh, on the federal side especially for for individuals you see a lot of new credits were, were added in but the states generally don't conform to to federal tax credits so without these offsetting credits um the ones that aren't passing legislation to either reduce rates or depart from some of these provisions are typically seeing their their total state tax base rise. So, you know, the lack of the lack of activity can kind of create a an incentive, right, for the states to get more money and more revenues into their coffers. All right, great. Well, it looks like from our our poll results that many of you are going to uh, see an, uh, a change, and a lot of you are uncertain whether you'll see an impact from these or not. And that, I think that's certainly true. We'll know more when we get our 2018 returns uh, prepared and filed. We'll have a better sense of how these tax provisions work. All right. Thank you, Jared. Uh, let's move on and talk about sort of where things are going beyond 2019. We've had a really good uh, presentation discussion about all the things that are in flux at the moment. Let's talk about where uh, we see things going in the future. <clears throat> so with sales tax, uh, Lauren already talked extensively about many of these areas. I just want to highlight uh, a couple of small areas. One being the growth in these marketplace providers being the ones to collect and remit tax. It, I, I think it's almost like the, the wholesalers and the retailers. Uh, they're going to treat the underlying sales company almost like the wholesaler and the marketplace as the retailer and have them do the collecting and reporting. But uh, that's not going to relieve the underlying companies, as Lauren mentioned, because you've got multiple bases that you may be selling through. Uh, it is interesting that a number of places are expanding what is subject to tax, digital goods and services. But of, of note here, we've got two states, Missouri and Arizona, who've actually had constitutional amendments to stop that initiative to expand into additional areas subject to tax. So they they actually have limited sales tax and said, you know, it's not going to include services through a constitutional amendment, not just legislation and state law, but from a state constitutional amendment. So something to watch uh, as uh, states move forward. And finally, the last area to think about is for a number of years now, we're going to have to deal with pre and post Wayfair nexus issues. And, and when does that look back happen? And how are the states going to apply this uh, pre and post the uh, Wayfair decision and or state when state laws for nexus came into play? Uh, rules on that. All right, Jared, let's talk about 
a little bit more on the SALT implications for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Jared talked about a number of the areas that uh, the states have tackled first, including 199A and the international tax provisions and interest expense and uh, uh, bonus depreciation and expensing. But there are a number of areas that the states have not addressed well yet. And one of those that we see as a huge opportunity is for qualified opportunity zones. Now, all the states through their governors had the opportunity last summer to designate, identify and designate those um uh, qualified opportunity zones, they're going to be great, but are they, the states going to follow along with the deferral of gains, the reductions of gains, and the, even the elimination of gains that are going to be the source for funding economic development in those opportunity zones? So something we'll need to watch and see how the states respond uh, to that cut in their tax base. Are they going to follow the federal provisions uh, with allowing that those gains not to be taxed right away or even not taxed at all, uh, or are they going to decouple from those provisions? Um, talk about another area that has been hot in the news is have been what we call the SALT cap workaround. As you recall, under the tax law um, that came into play, the limitation of $10,000 was placed on individuals for how much they could take as an itemized deduction for state and local tax payments. Well, this certainly impacted states with very high state income tax and property taxes and other costs, such as New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, those areas. And so they immediately started to work on how they could create situations to have their residents pay in some other form that was not a state tax payment or a property tax payment so that their residents could get credit for that those payments against their tax obligations but have it not be called a tax and limited for income tax purposes and one of the ways they've done that is to create some charitable organizations state-sponsored charitable organizations that um, uh, you make a payment to this charitable organization, and then in exchange, you are rewarded with a tax credit. And it could be either for paying your property taxes or for income taxes. In August of August 23rd of 2018, just about nine or ten months ago, the IRS uh, released proposed regulations, which clearly stomped on this initiative and said, hey, we're not going to recognize this any payments to these type organizations after this August 23rd date. Um, the broad sweep of those regulations also covered some pre-existing programs, scholarship programs that had been in around for a good many years. Um, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, a number of states have charitable contribution deductions to scholarship granting organizations, and in exchange, taxpayers were rewarded with an income, income tax credit in that state. So uh, it's going to put all of those in jeopardy as well. And the advantage there, of course, if you could take a charitable contribution deduction, there are far fewer limits on that than there is for a state income tax deduction. There were a couple of other ways that companies were coming up with or states were coming up with to work around the state assault cap. One was to have employees make a, a, an additional contribution or withholding from their pay. Uh, that's not working out very well. Only New York has offered this, and it, it really costs the employer more money to deal with this. So it's not a very popular program. And the, the latest area that's getting a lot of buzz in Connecticut and Wisconsin have adopted this is to uh, for pass-through entities, partnerships, S-corporations, uh, limited liability companies, is for the entity itself to pay the tax, uh, an, an entity-level tax, and then pass through a credit to the individual owners. Um, that sort of contravenes the whole idea of why you would have pass-through tax entities anyway to be taxed at the individual level and treats it more like a C corporation, a, an entity paying and, and obligated to pay tax. The other issue is if you have multi-state organization or owners who are not in resident in that state, will they be allowed a credit if the tax is paid in Wisconsin, but the owner of the S corporation lives in Illinois, will Illinois respect and give credit for to that individual owner for 
the taxes that Wisconsin withheld on with uh, on on the business in Wisconsin. Uh, most likely, that is not going to be allowed, and that is a problem unless all states uh, join in and play the same game. Then uh, in individual owners can be whipsawed on this, uh, having taxes withheld in one place that they do not get credit for in another place. So um, let's look at the next area, which is nexus expansion. Lauren talked extensively how Wayfair has expanded economic nexus in the sales tax area. Well, Public Law 86-272 has been the place to restrict nexus to physical presence for income tax purposes for many, many years. It means you had to do, be doing more than just soliciting sales of tangible property in a state for this to apply. And so now, there's, now that Wayfair has passed, they're going back and revisiting this idea of economic nexus for tangible personal property and for services and others. What does it take to have a presence in a state now? And the MTC or multi-state tax commission has established a working group to think about this and to recommend to different states uh, sort of an overall plan for how to um, write legislation in their own states to implement a new economic nexus type approach. It's going it, to, there's a hard push by the state's taxing authorities to get this in place and make it happen because much with, as, as we saw with Wayfair, they see this as another way to get a lot of out of income from out of state businesses into their state. It could be a, even as extensive as, uh, whether someone is accepting a cookie on their own, on a computer, a customer accepts a cookie on a computer in order to buy goods from a company website, does that mean that the company now has a presence wherever that customer's computer is? Uh, that's a that's a that's a very far-reaching reach when it comes to Nexus, but we just want you to know that that is still in play and that is something to watch over the future. All right, Jared, let's talk about trust taxation just a bit. Uh, there was a very important case, the Kimberly Rice Kastner 1992 Family Trust. It has been uh, approved by the Supreme Court to be heard, and the question is all about whether or not a trust uh, is taxable in a state simply because the beneficiaries are located in that state. Is that enough um, activity and connection with the state for due process to apply and the trust can be taxed. And here we have a case in North Carolina where the beneficiaries of the trust, the trust is not resident to North Carolina, but the beneficiaries are. North Carolina taxed the trust on income that it withheld, not distributed, but withheld within the trust simply because the beneficiaries were resident, uh, residents of North Carolina and they will eventually receive those that money and that income in, in the trust. Uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, said, no, we don't think that's enough and uh, said, ruled in the taxpayer's favor, said the, that trust is not taxable in North Carolina. But there's enough uncertainty and enough confusion among various states that the Supreme Court has agreed to look at this case and consider it. So definitely something we want to watch uh, for uh, businesses that are owned by trusts as well as trusts. So many trusts that are set up for individuals and their families um, and with individuals moving all over the country and all over the world. This certainly makes it more difficult for trusts if they have to track where a beneficiary is in order to provide a connection to that state. Okay, and finally, a few last trends to watch. Uh, first off is a continuing decrease in corporate income tax rates. We're seeing that as, as competition and incentives. Incentives continue to grow. Uh, the Amazon 2 headquarters that came out this year, uh, they selected spots even though others locations had offered them even greater incentives. A lot of the incentives have come under scrutiny, um, but we're still seeing that as an important recruitment tool by the states. <clears throat> Legalized sports betting. This is a big deal. Uh, I mean, we'll see more and more of this as states figure out how to legalize, how to uh, tax, how to uh, control and oversee uh, sports betting. We're we're expecting to see many more states besides uh, New Jersey was first on the list. They were the ones that got the uh, the case won 
and um, uh, we're first first out of the gate, but we're seeing a number of other states move forward in this area. And finally, we expect to see a growing emphasis uh, on excise taxes on marijuana, whether that's medical marijuana, as those number of states increase that allow some form of cannabis to be used in for medical purposes, as well as the growing list of states with recreational marijuana usage, uh, taxation of these areas will become far more important and uh, another source of revenues, one of those uh, sin, sin goods taxes that Lauren had mentioned for both uh, income tax, excise taxes, and sales and use taxes. All right, with that, um, Lauren, I think we've got our next, our last polling question here to come up. And then we want you to hang on for just a minute after that uh, so Lauren can show you where to find information on website. So here's our last polling question. Uh, which of these salt trends will you keep be keeping an eye on? And uh, that lets us know also the kinds of things that you're interested in that we can help provide some additional information on. So sales tax and Wayfair, uh, adoptions and modifications of, of state tax, when it comes to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions, uh, economic nexus for state income tax, how that's expanding, and incentives and credits for economic development, uh, you're, or you're just not sure that any of those are, are going to impact your business uh, or your activities very, very much. So um, give us some thoughts on that. And so with that, um, I think everybody's had a chance to answer all that poll. Chrissy, why don't you go ahead and show us what that poll looks like? All right. A lot of you are very interested in sales tax and Wayfair, as with some of the other areas as well. So you could certainly answer more than more than one on those items. All right. Uh, let's close that poll. And um, I think now we have, yes. So Lauren, can you talk to us about how what what people can find at jerrybeckertsalestax.com. Sure. Of course, we have our corporate website, cbh.com, but we also have a website specifically dedicated to sales and use tax issues. So I know there was several questions about where can I see the list of um, states that have imposed economic nexus and the states that are imposing marketplace facilitator laws. And if you go to the uh, cherrybeckersalesax.com, you can go to the Knowledge Center up at the top. And Jared, if you kind of click through this slide, it'll kind of step-by-step -step Knowledge Center, eBooks and checklists, and then the charts on the next page. And that will get you um, a current up-to-date list of what's happening in every state. And then I think just some final last resources. Um, again, we've got all sorts of great information on the sales tax website. We've got lots of blogs, we've got uh, webinars, we've got white papers. Um, really, we're, we're, we're here to provide you as much information as you need. Um, we've got all of our contact information, Kathy, uh, who Unfortunately, it was a little under the weather, but we had a great last minute substitute with Sarah. Um, my contact information and Jarrett's. So all sorts of resources to keep you in the know. Sarah, do you want to add any anything? Any last comments? Uh, yes. I just want to say thank you all for your time today. And if you can please uh, provide us some feedback in the evaluation survey when it comes out, we would very much appreciate it, including uh, topics you'd like to hear from uh, our sales, our state and local tax team um, in the future. Hope you all have a good afternoon. <laughs>